Okay, so I want to welcome everyone. This topic is called easy to grow orchids, but actually we'll be talking about a wide variety of orchids because I understand that some people have already heard some of my other talks. I decided to include some really nice pictures of a variety with the theme of easy to grow. Okay, so on this slide, I'm showing one of the Oncidium hybrids, uh, Oncosteel eye candy pinky. And this is a picture of my own plant. So mm -hmm. I'm the president of the Honolulu Orchid Society and I welcome all of you to our orchid series. Okay, so easy to grow. I'm gonna ask if anyone has their definition of easy to grow, anyone? Don't have to do anything to the plant. Yeah, do nothing. <laughs> what else? What else? Really? Low maintenance. Low maintenance. Very important. Anything else? What does the plant? What's that? Can't kill the plant. Can't kill. Oh, I hadn't thought of that one. So like an indestructible plant. Okay, so we're gonna be thinking about these things because as I was trying to design this talk, I was thinking, well, easy to grow. How do you define that? What does that really mean to different people? Is it easy to grow because I know all the tricks or is it easy to grow because with benign neglect, it still grows? So um, is it easy for anyone to grow? Is it effortless? Is it easy for a beginner to grow? This is a picture of Cloesia Rebecca Northern, and it is relatively easy to grow. If you notice, there are three bulbs there, and each of the bulbs has already lost their leaves. And that's because for this plant, it is a winter bloomer. It grows through the spring and through the fall, and then right around December, its leaves start to turn yellow and they fall off. But despite that, the bulb, that thick, round, kind of looking like an onion bulb, is holding energy. And then a flower spike emerges. And during the December, January months, this beautiful spike of flowers comes out that's fragrant. And that is common for this particular orchid. Um, so... In some respects, if you can just take care of it from spring through fall, it does this automatically. You don't have to encourage it to do anything in particular. It's already saved up all of its energy. So that's a really good example of relatively easy to grow. The hard part is it's not easy to find. There are only a few places where you can find this catacetum hybrid called Cloesia. Okay, so what is the definition of easy? Uh, it's adaptable, it's not picky, it resists pests and diseases, it can do well in a variety of settings, and it doesn't require much care. So I think we can all agree that those are kind of easy type things that a plant might have. So here's a picture of Spathoglottis. It's a landscape orchid. You can just go to Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart and you can find spathoglottis, comes in many different colors. And people use it to do like a border plant or a hedge plant or uh, low growing, a little bit taller than ground cover. And here's some examples of uh, the colors, which can be actually quite pleasant. This is an orchid. So I would say um, it's probably one of the easiest um, because you can see that it's in full sun, literally and its leaves are actually doing quite well. As they get old, they do get brown on the tips there. And it um, blooms over and over and over again. So I would say continuous bloomer from early spring through late, late, late fall. Uh, this picture on the right is actually something I took within the last five days. Uh, actually, both of them are things that I took within the last few weeks. And so these things are in bloom, but you might not have noticed them. Uh, it's adaptable. So we'll go through each of these terms. Adaptable will grow in various settings, 
not fussy about light, watering, what's the temperature, what's the humidity. Um, hybrid orchids, which have parents that are species or nearly species, will tend to have combinations of the traits, growing traits of each of its parents. And sometimes that helps the plant be able to tolerate broader conditions. Hybrid orchids are the common ones you can find like dendrobiums and cattleyas. Uh, this on the right hand side is a picture of a vanda, which was rescued from a nursery and uh, out in the full sun, not getting anything in particular, maybe gets rained on, sometimes I water it and it has no trouble with blooming over and over and over again. So I will get maybe four or five of these flower spikes in the course of a year. Uh, one warning is that if you do buy a species orchid, and we'll talk a little bit about that more in the future, um, they do have particular requirements and that sometimes makes it a little bit harder to take care of. But if you know that that's a species orchid and it doesn't like to have water in the winter months, what you do is you just put it on the side and not in your watering area. Uh, not picky. So healthy plants that are a little bit larger, more mature, will tolerate not being watered or maybe varied light or maybe not being fertilized. And so these are two examples. On the left, Dendrobium lindleyae. And it is, is actually something I saw in Southeast Asia and Cambodia uh, uh, hanging from various places in people's yards and in full bloom with flowers, like literally two or 300 yellow flowers. Um, this particular plant of mine uh, is a little bit older. So you can see there's a shriveled up bulb and a tiny leaf. Well, each of those shriveled up bulbs and tiny leaves can take about a year to grow. So you see how many bulbs there are, there are quite a few. So that plant's probably about 12 or 14 years old. As being an older plant, it has more reserve, so it can send out several flower spikes to be enjoyed. On the right is Dendrobium samurai. So that's a hybrid Dendrobium, but it's very nice looking. It's in my landscape. Uh, getting varied amounts of relatively bright light. And it's not fussy, it likes being fertilized, but if you don't fertilize, it's fine. And so that's a good example of a dendrobium, which could be in a landscape, uh, in a big pot or tied to a tree or a post or a tree fern or almost anything. And so that's a, a really easy plant to take care of. Uh, it can resist pests and diseases. If it has broad, flat leaves, uh, it could be attacked in the hotter months by spider mites. You'll know because the leaf starts to become discolored and a little bit lighter in color. And then when you turn the leaf upside down, you can see that there's a fine amount of small insects biting the leaf. And then you need to treat it for spider mites. But it's something that happens during the hot summer months, something to watch for. If the leaves look very um, medium green on the surface and they look pretty healthy, odds are you're not being bothered by spider mites. And then the other question is where are these spider mites coming from? And it's usually your neighbors. So if your neighbors are being attacked by that kind of pest, sometimes it can jump over to your area. Uh, pseudobulbs with sheets can also harbor scale. So in the, in the upcoming pictures, I'll show you where the cane or pseudobulb has a brown sheath on it, which can be peeled off. Uh, and then smaller tender buds can be attacked by thrips. This is especially true with Hono Hono. So Hono Hono dendrobium, as it buds, usually about January or February, when it's really small and just beginning, sometimes can be attacked by thrips and then you lose all the buds and then you lose all the flowers as well. On the bottom left-hand corner, I'm showing an example of crown rot. That's where fungus or bacteria can get into the center of a phalaenopsis or a vanda plant when water is sitting there for too long uh, and not able to be drained out or evaporate, then fungus can start to attack the crown. 
Now, just because this happens doesn't mean you lose the plant. Yes, the growing new leaves are destroyed, but the plant knows this. And if the plant is kept healthy enough with enough light to its green leaves, then they have a new shoot that comes out at the base. And then you have a cakey plant that leads into essentially a clone of the same plant. On the right, I'm showing Vanda Miss Joaquin, which is a old favorite cut flower. So people use this in lays and haku and so forth, uh, but it's a very strong grower. And if you look at the leaves next to the, the lavender purple flowers, it's kind of a pencil shaped uh, or straw shaped leaf that tolerates quite a bit of light. So I have these plants out in full sunlight and they tolerate that pretty well. Uh, and you can also see kind of gray colored uh, roots that are coming out and being in the air. Those are called area roots. Um, when this plant is mature, let's say two, three, four feet tall, it will continuously bloom from the spring through the fall. And then you can harvest the flowers if you like. Okay, does well in a variety of settings. It tolerates the, the easy to grow plant can tolerate more light, which helps with more flowers or less light. And then the leaves turn a little bit darker shade of green and it may tolerate a winter rest or maybe a minimal winter rest. Now, when I first got started with orchids, I didn't understand about winter rest. It just means that in the place where some of these orchids naturally grow, there's a wet season in the summer and a dry season in the winter. So dry that in some orchids, you can literally stop watering completely from around December through around March or a little bit less sometimes. In our area, what we like to do is just look at the plant and if it's leaves or it's bulbs or it's canes look kind of wrinkled up, then we can give it a little bit of water, but very sparingly. What's the problem with giving water all year round is that one, it can sometimes help the plant to grow too well. And then the plant gets lots of light, gets lots of sun, and then it just wants to grow. And can I ask everyone to mute? Thank you. Um, if you get too much water and too much light year round, the plant just grows and grows and grows, and it forgets that it needs to flower. So that sometimes happens. Um, so something to keep in mind. So again, an example of this Oncidium eye candy. Um, the plant may uh, doesn't require much care. So you kind of just leave it to its rainwater and other things. Um, so you're less active or less needed to be doing specific things. Um, it's usually a good uh, practice to cut off the spent flower spikes as they dry up and turn brown, you can just cut them right off. Or I've showed a picture here in the bottom middle of seed pods. So when the flower gets pollinated, let's say by bees or any other insects, then the plant will actually naturally easily produce a seed pod. So I have a picture here of three seed pods from one uh, dendrobium spike. Um, the problem with leaving it on is that it oftentimes uses a lot of energy from the plant and that you want to avoid. So when the flowers are done, go ahead and cut off the flowers. Or if you see anything that looks like a seed pod, you can go ahead and cut those off. Uh, in the past, what people did was they tried to make their own crosses. And so they would select the pollen, select the mother plant, and then do this to create seed pods. And then they will put a tag on the seed pod saying, the parents of the seed pod are this parent and that parent, and it was pollinated on this date. And then about six to eight months later, the seed pod matures and gets really big and gets yellow and then bursts open. Before it bursts open, you're supposed to remove it and give it to a sterile lab that takes care of seed pods and they can actually uh, hatch the eggs out onto a sterile auger plate 
and try to see if they can germinate the seeds and grow into thousands and thousands of orchids for that cross in that seed pot. That was a very common practice in the past. It's harder to find labs that will do this. And there's no guarantee whatsoever that you're gonna get a viable orchid plant in the future. Even though there's literally millions and millions of, of eggs in there or seeds in there and the chance for getting uh, many plants is high. There's also a chance of getting literally no plants. It depends on the ability of that particular cross to be fertile. Okay, and then the other things are remove the dead leaves because dead leaves can be broken down and lead to more disease and whatnot and pests and don't repot unless you really need to. Uh, on the right is a picture of some vandas that were cuttings that I put into this big pot and it literally has only roots. So rainwater, or maybe if I water it, it can get wet on the roots, but the root system is quite large and the vandas uh, grow about two leaves per year or so. So we just let them grow taller and taller and then they flower. Okay, so some general key rules. Avoid overwatering. Probably the biggest mistake we make is that we water too often. You should water well, let it all drain out. And when I say water well, I mean like water for minutes, like five to 10 minutes in one place. Let the water run through and soak the bark or soak the roots of the plant. Um, and then don't water again. So the overwatering part is don't water every day. Water a lot, but let it all dry out. The next time to water is when the media, the bark or the plant has completely dried out. That's when you should water. Shade from the full sun. Almost, almost no orchid is really meant for the full sun. I have some of my plants in my landscape and I have actually trained them to tolerate full sun. I watch the plants and if it looks like they're getting a little bit too baked in the sun, I will sometimes move them to a slightly less sunny area, maybe a little shade, maybe do that during the full summer months. Right now it's February, so the sun is weaker than uh, in full in midsummer. So now the plants are actually doing fairly good being outdoors. Um, you can keep the roots healthy and that is the key to making stronger plants. Without strong, healthy roots, it's very difficult for the plant to absorb moisture as well as nutrients. And then just watch your plants. Don't like check in on them once a month. That's a little bit not enough. This is a picture of another catacetum, um, similar to that other one, the Cloesia that I showed you earlier. This one is uh, catacetum dentigianum, SVO. And again, it has a big green leaf that will fall off in the winter months. And this one actually flowered around late fall. So it still has its leaves, it's not quite winter. But if I show you this actual plant right now, it is only the bulb, no leaves. Okay, on watering, this is a picture of different media. So in the top left-hand corner is sphagnum moss. It holds a lot of moisture. So if you water it, it will be like a sponge and hold lots of moisture. On plants that are um, in a pot with sphagnum moss, usually Phalaenopsis is this way when you buy the plant. You can see that it's sphagnum moss. You know that when you add water, it will be quite heavy. That's usually a sign that the water is in there. For that kind of plant, you only need to water about once a week but you don't want to let that sphagnum moss dry out so much that it becomes like a dry sponge. When it's like a dry sponge, it actually will resist water. So no matter how much water you put on top of it, it all just rolls off unless you really soak it well. And then it will re-moisturize and then hold moisture. So on sphagnum moss, water about once a week. And the, the key to that is just hold up the pot and see how heavy it is. If it feels light, like a dry sponge would, then water it. If it feels pretty heavy, even though the top looks dry, then don't water, wait. 
Um, if it's pine bark on the bottom left hand of the picture, you can see bark. That's uh, something which is a really common media. When water goes on it, it, it soaks up the water a little bit, turns a little darker color. For that kind of media, you might want to water about twice a week. Watering less is better than watering too much. Okay, sunlight. Uh, give adequate sunlight. What is adequate sunlight? Enough so that you don't sunburn. Once you sunburn the leaves, then the leaves will remain damaged. So a little less light is a better thing than too much light. As you move your plants from one location to another, especially you have to be careful not to move it to a place where the plant could sunburn. Shade cloth is used to reduce the light and it comes in different amounts of shade, sometimes 50% shade, sometimes 60 or 70% shade. Most plants like Vandas, this top right-hand picture is Vandas, can take 50% shade, whereas a lot of the other plants like Dendrobium will do better with 60 or 70% shade. Cattleyas will enjoy more light, Vandas will enjoy more light, many of the other ones, so more, a little bit more shade. So in this top right-hand corner, these were uh, rescued Vandas from another nursery. So uh, I just wired them to some palms that I had in my landscape, and they are just trying to recover. It's been about two years now, and um, bottom picture is a picture of some of the flowers from one of the Vandas uh, right there. And I don't do anything to them. I just hung them up on the palm trees and they get rainwater and I water once in a while. Uh, roots, uh, without good roots, orchids can dry up and die. Roots need moisture, but also they need air. Orchids are air plants. Roots also need to be kind of full and plump not all shriveled up and dry. If you see shriveled up and dry, then that root is no longer functioning. You can actually clip it right off. Um, if you give roots too much moisture, like the bark or the sphagnum moss is too wet for too long and never dries out, then roots tend to rot. So that's not a good thing. So in the bottom left-hand picture is a Dendrophylax funalis, which is a leafless orchid. It never grows leaves. So how does it make energy? How does it photosynthesize? Well, if you look at those roots that are sort of gray, light green, when I water it, it will turn a better medium green because in the root is the ability, is chlorophyll and has the ability to photosynthesize and create sugar for the plant. So although it has no leaves at all, never does, it has roots that function like leaves, okay? So these are sort of bare root, bare area roots. So I have this hung up um, with a little bit of shade around it. And then I just give it water every day if I possibly can. Otherwise it's outdoors, so it gets rainwater. And then you see those three little spiky things. Those are new flower spikes that would lead to the picture on the right. It's a picture of the... Um, small green flower, doesn't have much fragrance to it, but it's nice to grow a very unusual type of uh, plant like this. So I would say as long as you check on this plant like every once a week or every two weeks and you put it in a place where it can get rainwater and hopefully you're not in a really dry area, it should kind of grow on its own and not do very much. And then once in a while, maybe every six months or so, I take a look at it and make sure that if there's any old roots, I just cut off the old roots. And then when you remove roots or remove dead stuff, it's always good to fertilize your, uh, it's always good to sterilize your tools so that you don't spread viral infection or other types of infection from one plant to another. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk about the easy pellet fertilizer. This one is Island Supreme 131111 which has to do with this nitrogen phosphorus uh, content. It's a controlled slow time release. So it may last anywhere from six to, uh, the, the package says five to six months. So maybe apply it in January and in June, 
uh, moisture and heat allow the release of the fertilizer from the little pellet. Just by looking at the pellet, you can't really tell if the pellet is old or new. So if you just have a schedule of January and June to put a few pellets in, then that will work. It contains important minor elements that the plant can't otherwise get naturally. And it works with a liquid fertilizer if you wanna go that route. Only trouble is don't apply too much because if you apply it heavy, it's like overfeeding. Uh, so in a small four inch pot, you might wanna have maybe six or eight pellets, not very much at all. Um, you don't have to worry about removing the old pellets because they lose their ability to release the fertilizer after that time period. And they will keep in the bag. So as long as they're kept away from moisture and heat, they will remain okay for you to use um, next time around. Uh, but once they're out in the heat and the moisture, they're actually releasing the fertilizer without you trying. Uh, just to be complete, I'm gonna show you this one. This is the liquid fertilizer. So for some, if you want to mix like a half teaspoon or a teaspoon per gallon, then you can throw this into water, mix it up, and you can throw it on the roots or the leaves of the plant. And the plant will absorb this quicker. You can apply it like once a month or like every two weeks. And it doesn't have to be full strength. Actually, the plants will do perfectly well with half strength. This one happens to be a 13 to 13. I would recommend that you not use anything but orchid fertilizers. So orchid fertilizers have a little bit lower numbers than what you might see from other type of plant fertilizers. Um, and that lower number is a little less hard on the plant in terms of uh, feeding it. You wanna not overdo it. So you wanna dilute this, feed the entire plant. Uh, and then once a week, if you are fertilizing, once a week, flush out all of the extra salts that may accumulate. Salts would be like that white stuff. If you look on the pots at the drain holes, you see a little bit of white, especially on clay pots or plastic pots that are older. And that's all a byproduct of the fertilizing material or the hardness of your water. And this also contains minor elements. So these types of fertilizer, the pellets, as well as this liquid fertilizer, are available at like Cola Farmers or Walmart, Home Depot, and so forth. Okay, so now when you're watching over them, you're keeping an eye on your plants, enjoying the flowers, and just making sure that they look healthy and not getting uh, problems. If you spot problems, you can always let people at the orchid show know or let me know and we can usually intervene and try to correct the problem before it can affect the plant. If the plant looks pretty healthy, then that's a good sign it's gonna to continue to be that way. Uh, also, removing the weeds is a good idea, otherwise the weeds will try to take over. So on the right is uh, FDK, Fred Clark area, After Dark, which is a catacetum type hybrid, very beautiful flowers that have some fragrance. And on the left is a Bobophyllum macoyanum, which is a very unusual kind of flower. So you see sort of a starburst to the flowers. Each of those is a flower. So it's like a dozen flower all in a little circle. And this plant, actually I just took the picture the other day, has small green leaves and you notice it's um, next to some shade cloth. That's a 50% shade cloth and that's covering the plant over the top, uh, cutting back on some of the water, uh, some of the light so that the plant can get light and hopefully bloom. And in this case, I got, oh, looks like five, six flower spikes and a new one just coming up. So actually this is the most flower spikes that I've had on this plant. This plant is now like 10 years old. Okay, so now I wanted to show you in general seven examples of easy orchids. Um, here in the pictures, I'm just showing you an example of Dendrobium inobi purple on the left. I just got this plant and it is a very bright, even lavender purple. And then on the right is a Dendrobium inobi purple 
but a mutation called splash mutation. Very, very popular. It has um, white with on the edge a little bit of that same purple. So it ends up being that this Inobi purple splash is uh, something which can be um, brought into new plants, but not very easily. If that plant has a baby, a keiki, it will be this splash variation. If you clone it, interestingly, and genetically, they're all the same. If you clone it, only about 5% of the thousands of cloned plants will be this splash. The rest will be like the bottom left-hand corner, uh, purple, just clearly purple. And then a few will be white because one of the parents is white. So kind of interesting. So these seven examples we're gonna go over are Phalaenopsis, Dendrobium, Cattleya, Oncidium, Brassivola, Epidendrum, and Maxillarium. So these are genuses. There are like broad classes of orchids that are ones that are relatively easy and straightforward to get depending on where you look and relatively easy to grow if you follow a few things. Okay, so the first one is Phalaenopsis. It's a moth orchid. Uh, it prefers shade. You can water it a little bit less often, like once a week. It has very long lasting flowers, sometimes two months if you can keep it in a cool place. So I used to keep flowers like this in my office, which was air conditioned, and it was easily two months where they would last and very nice to have for the office. Um, and they're very colorful and you can enjoy them. So here are three examples of Phalaenopsis that I have uh, grown. In the upper right is Phalaenopsis bellicose with this uh, kind of spotted purple on its um, cascading flower spike. On the bottom left is Phalaenopsis avant-garde with uh, a combination of lavender on the edge plus kind of purple in the middle with a little bit of dots. And on the bottom right, Phalaenopsis trovato, which I have in bloom right now, that shows more of a veined um, coloration with a lighter lavender uh, and spots. So all of these are really good examples of modern and available Phalaenopsis. And one is not better than the other. Uh, Phalaenopsis is known for its very broad flat and round petals. Um, so those are great examples. Uh, here's some examples too. They're easy to find at the fa farmer's market or garden stores. Um, you can cut the flower spike to get a new flower spike to rebloom. So let's look at the bottom left-hand picture. So as the, I don't know if you can see my my arrow here, as the old spike finishes, you can break or cut at the highest point of the old flower spike before a new growth bud is. And that will lead to another flower spike. And on that one, you can cut it back to that same point and another flower spike will come up. So on this bottom left-hand picture, I'm actually showing you the same old flower spike that was cut twice and still leading to a new flower spike. In general, uh, for orchids that are in Hawaii, once they bloom, that one flower spike generally will not allow you to have a new flower spike unless it's during the time of year that's cooler with less sun, which typically is December through February. Is a time when a brand new flower spike will come up from the base of the plant. Other than that, uh, the rest of the time, the rest of the year, the, fl the new flower spike would tend not to happen, which means that if your old flower spike is willing, you can just cut it and then a new swelling will occur and a new flower spike will come out. Uh, on the right is an example of Phalaenopsis Isin pink spider. And that was one of the award-winning uh, Phalaenopsis. This picture is a great example of a branching flower spike where there was one area where the flowers were coming out from it and then two more spikes 
on the right and the left came out as well. So it's like having three, three flower spikes on one. Okay, so here's an example of my growing area for Phalaenopsis. All of these actually are old flower spikes that were cut to get a new spike to come out. All of these plants were actually in bloom around fall. So in the fall, summer months, they had a flower spike, it died back, I cut them. And then in the winter months, around December, January, a new swelling occurred and then now they're all in bloom. Notice that they are on a table and in my patio. To the left of this picture is where I have morning sun. And so all of the flower spikes are sort of oriented towards the light of the sun. And um, otherwise they're not really getting too much bright light. Okay, dendrobiums. So an example of Honohono dendrobiums is this picture on the right, Dendrobium nifert sweet lilani. It's actually a hybrid. Um, for dendrobiums, if you have flowering dendrobiums, usually it will be around March, right around now to March, end of March will be flowering uh, honohonos that you can buy. After they finish flowering, you can actually cut the canes and place the canes on a tray. And then you don't have to really water it too much. It will decide whether it has the energy in the cut cane to develop a new plant, a keiki. So here on the left side is a picture of a keiki growth coming out of a cane. And then when the roots are not as long as this picture, more like one inch long, you can actually cut the cane apart and repot this small keiki plant into a new two inch or three inch pot. And that will grow into a new honohono orchid dendrobium. Uh, you can fertilize these new plants or your old plants regularly as they grow from spring through fall. And then in the winter months, right around November or Thanksgiving time, you cut back on water, cut back on all fertilizing, and you let the plant go into a dormant rest period so that it can rest and save up energy to be able to bud in January or February, and then hopefully bloom in the spring right around March. For Cattleya, uh, which is very popular and easy to find, um, they have long lasting fragrant flowers. They may bloom once or twice yearly, depending on the type of Cattleya they are. Uh, they can be divided, which means as a plant grows bigger and has more growth, they can actually grow big enough that you can split one plant into two plants. The rule of thumb for Cattleya is that you need at least two or three of those pseudobulbs in order to divide the plant. So if the plant is old enough that it has, let's say, six pseudobulbs, then you can actually cut it in half and make two plants out of it. Um, if you buy a Cattleya and it's really young, you will notice that it doesn't have very many pseudobulbs. So it may take many years before it becomes mature and big enough that you can actually divide the plant into two. You can repot it and that helps for it to grow bigger, but not to divide the plant. Uh, it needs in general, a little bit more bright or diffuse light, but not full sun. So you see on this picture on the right that the color of the leaves is a little lighter apple green type color versus the picture on the left that's a little bit more of a deep medium green. In general, you want it to be the lightest possible green for the leaves that doesn't cause sunburn. And that helps the plant to be able to um, grow and be able to flower. So. On the example on the left, RLC Sueno de Amor, that is a great example of an award-winning hybrid. So it's a hybrid Cattleya, very good smelling and very large round flowers. On the right is Cattleya amethystoglossa. Amethystoglossa is a species orchid where it needs that winter rest. 
if you don't give it the winter rest, the plant tends not to do well. It needs that time to conserve energy and then hopefully in the spring, go ahead and bloom. But you need to know that. Uh, here's an example of Oncidium. It's popular, it's relatively common. You can find them at uh, farmer's markets and sometimes at big box stores. They have many long lasting flowers. Uh, sometimes they're fragrant. These two examples I'm showing you here have a chocolate fragrance. Um, you can divide the plants into several plants after about two or three years of growth. They're pretty robust growers. Um, and they bloom more than once a year. Uh, my Oncidium Heaven Scent, the bottom right-hand corner one, I've noticed that it blooms at least twice a year. And it, and it also blooms on every new bulb that comes out. So on that plant, I might have three flower spikes. Uh, here's another example of Oncidium. You probably have this in your landscape or your yard or in your neighbor's yard. They're very easy to grow. This is an example of the popcorn orchid or dancing lady, some people call it, Oncidium spasilatum. It can grow quite large. So this pot here, this cement pot in the picture might be like 12 inch pot and the plant might be a little too heavy to move, but it's in full sun and fairly light in its green color, um, but it's very cheerful and has how many flower spikes? It can be like 40 or 50 flower spikes. So it tolerates a lot of light, flowers well in the spring through the early summer. Uh, you get these nice yellow flowers and uh, little bulbs will come out from the very base there. So as the bulbs start to grow and grow and grow, you can actually clip them right off and throw them in a pot. And now you got a new plant growing. So usually with these new plants, when I uh, repot them, It'll take about two or three years and then you get a pretty healthy big plant. So very easy to uh, divide. Uh, Brassavola, this is an example. It's easy to grow, especially the hybrid forms. It has thin Hello. leaves. So I don't know, on the bottom picture, you mm -hmm. can sort of see it has thin, uh, but uh, it has narrow but thick leaves. So thick leaves usually means it holds water well which means if you don't for, uh, water too often, it still will do fine. And the narrow leaves usually collect less light, which means if you put it into more light, it will do fine. Uh, it's fragrant on the white flowers, which are pollinated at night by moths um, and can be divided into more plants as the plant gets bigger and bigger. On the bottom middle, picture is a picture of BC Mayumi, which has one of its parents as Brassavola nodosa, that white flower on the right. So this Mayumi has a, uh, resembles the parent a little bit, but has much more color to it. It's actually a hybrid between a Cattleya, it's a Garnaria uh, Beringiana and Brassavola nodosa. Uh, here's an example of Epidendrum. These are very popular. Uh, they're very cheerful in their colors. They're very common in landscapes. They're adaptable and they make cakey plants. So bottom left-hand corner is a recent addition to my collection. It's Epidendrum Mira Valley with this nice pink flower. And on the right, uh, as I was walking around in my neighborhood, I snapped this picture of various epidendrums in a landscape where you can see there's more than one type of plant and they're all trying to bloom at the same time. Uh, and then finally, Maxillaria. This is a picture of Maxillaria tenuifolia, the coconut orchid. So it has fragrance to it, but pretty easy to grow in pots or baskets. This one happens to be a hanging basket. Uh, it has thin leaves that tolerate more light. So I have this one hanging in a tree and it does get pretty much whatever light is out there in the tree. Uh, it does have this coconut fragrance, which is very enjoyable. Um, and then I make cuttings off of this. You can see that it has quite a bit of growth. I make cuttings and then I put them into a small four inch pot once a year after it finishes blooming. And that creates a new 
plant that will be uh, flowering the following year. Okay, so I have some orchid resources here I wanna share. Uh, you can read about orchid care. We have uh, online, Honolulu Orchid Society has its site and American Orchid Society has its site. Uh, those two are in red on this slide. You can talk to family or friends or neighbors. Uh, you can go to orchid meetings. You can come to Zoom meetings like the one you're at right now. You can check out uh, your local orchid nurseries. There are a few on Oahu. And by all means, ask questions. You can send me email or you can go to the Honolulu Orchid Society uh, site and we have an email contact there and you can uh, ask a question. Uh, these are just uh, PDFs. If you like, I can put these in the, um, in the chat and you can click on them and you can download them as information for resources. In summary, Hawaii is a great place to grow orchids. You can enjoy them and other um, tropical plants. Um, when you see nice orchids, then you should ask the owners, how did they grow them? If that's your neighbor or people at the orchid uh, clubs or shows and see what works in your area. Hawaii is a very nice place to be able to grow orchids outdoors without too much fuss. On the mainland, they actually have to grow them indoors and control their lighting and the humidity and temperature and all those things. We can just grow them outdoors here, which is really quite easy. And thank you for your attention. Uh, the Honolulu Orchid Society meets monthly on the second Wednesday at 7 p.m. at Lanakila Elementary Cafeteria. Coming up soon is our March 8th silent auction. We have this as an annual event where we have uh, nurseries from the Big Island, Maui and Oahu uh, donate orchid plants to us and then we display them and we set uh, minimum prices and people will look at it and place their bids, but it's open to the public. Uh, thank you to Melvin Walkie and Alan Nishioka, our photographers for Honolulu Orchid Society. I showed a few pictures here where they had taken it for our awards program. And this is a picture of the Bloom uh, Festival event, which was held in April of 2022, where we put up a display, an orchid display of various orchids. So you can see quite a variety there. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop share. Okay, and we can open it up for questions and answers. Actually, the last picture is what I envisioned the senior center, the new senior center having? Well, that is the goal. Mm. 